Welcome everybody to today's virtual seminar on Astatine 211. Uh, my name is Ethan Balkan, and I am the program manager for radioisotope production R&D within the DOE isotope program. Um, I'm just going to get right into my portion of the presentation uh, today so that we don't waste any time. All right. Hopefully everybody can see what I am currently sharing, but it's probably in the wrong orientation. Um, it's fine. I think you need to get into presentation mode. Yeah, I do. Go. Yeah. All right. Now you have it where we see Perfect. your upcoming slides. So. Yep. So um, what you see before you is a brief overview of the DOE Office of Science uh, statement of commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, which can be found on the Office of Science website. There is a link um, that's displayed in front of you if you want to copy that down. Um, you can do some more research as to uh, what DOE Office of Science is um, committed to carrying out and how we are um, uh, focusing in this particular area. I'm just going to re uh, read to you uh, two brief paragraphs. Uh, so the DOE Office of Science is fully committed to fostering safe, diverse, equitable, and inclusive work, research, and funding environments that value mutual respect and personal integrity, effective stewardship and promotion of diverse and inclusive workplaces, that value and celebrate a diversity of people, ideas, cultures, and educational backgrounds is foundational to delivering on the SC mission. The scientific community engaged in SC-sponsored activities is expected to be respectful, ethical, and professional. DOE Office of Science does not tolerate discrimination or harassment of any kind, including sexual or non-sexual harassment, bullying, intimidation, violence, threats of violence, retaliation or other disruptive behavior in the federal workplace, including DOE field site offices or at national laboratories, scientific user facilities, academic institutions, other institutions that we fund, or other locations where activities that we support are carried out. This virtual environment would be categorized as another location where an activity we are supporting is carried out. So with that in mind, um, I'm going to get into I'm going to get into uh, the overview of what the Office of Science, specifically the DOE Isotope Program, has been focused on with respect to Astatine 211 in the past 12 months. Um, it's a very exciting time in the world of alpha emitters uh, and an equally exciting one uh, in terms of Astatine 211 itself. Um, so, what I can tell you, and I need to stop. What I can tell you is that approximately um, 12 months ago, well, even further back than that, uh, the DOE Office of Science um, uh, invested in the isotope program, invested in um, the University Isotope Network in 2017. And that particular um, side effort was aimed at initially leveraging the unique facilities and human capital at domestic um, universities and colleges, uh, as well as um, uh, nonprofit research institutions to facilitate the production of short-lived medically relevant radionuclides. And at the time that the test case was asked to team 211. Uh, the initial thought was to um, bring about a production effort, leveraging the, those institutions that were capable of producing it um, to facilitate regionalized production. Uh, everybody in this particular room um, probably has an idea uh, that there are approximately 250 cyclotrons 
or accelerators capable of producing medically relevant radionuclides within the US. Of those 250, approximately five are capable of producing acetine 211. So it's an incredibly heavy lift. Uh, we did fund uh, several institutions. We funded five institutions, honestly, um, to try to bring about um, routine, reliable production at clinically relevant levels. That was how we initially categorized what success would be within this particular effort. Um, I can tell you that uh, right now, we have University of Washington, who is routinely producing astatine 211 uh, within the University Isotope Network, and we can uh, acquire uh, material directly from them. Texas A&M um, is short on, on uh, the heels of joining uh, the University Isotope Network, and we are uh, uh, eagerly anticipating uh, their arrival. Uh, the three other sites that we made in which we made investments are all considering their options, and those would be University of Pennsylvania or Penn, uh, Duke, as well as UC Davis. And they are in various states of readiness and um, um, states of discussions. Um, you will likely also note that there was a large announcement made somewhere in the uh, um, late March, April timeframe from both the DOE Isotope Program as well as several other agencies on the establishment of something called the World Astatine Community or the WAC. Um, that particular effort is tripartite in nature. Um, it, was, uh, uh, it, it was conceived of at a side meeting at the IAEA last year and involves representatives from Japan, from the EU, and from the US. Uh, I am the, uh, the DOE Isotope Programs representative uh, within the, the, the World Team community. And uh, what that particular community seeks to do is to leverage existing investments within each of the governmental structures that are, are, are conducting work and to make astatine available globally. This is not something where, um, where we are incredibly concerned about competition between countries, between nation states, um, because of the short half-life of this particular radionuclide um, and the clinical relevance that it potentially brings to uh, the population it, it would seek to treat, um, this is this is a uh, this is a situation where where um, we need to bring people together and disseminate information and share technology. To that end, uh, you'll be hearing about advancements made at several universities. Those folks are on the panel uh, in front of your screens right now. And um, I hope that uh, at the end of this particular session, uh, you'll have a little bit greater appreciation for what the isotope program is seeking to do. Uh, we are making available, and I hope, uh, I hope Yavan speaks to this, but uh, there's an invention that came out of University of Washington, which is uh, made available globally uh, through licensing uh, in the university, at the University of Washington. Um, so if you're interested in, in what's going on there, uh, contact should be made to uh, um, the folks at University of Washington. Um, and if you have other questions on what's happening at other universities, um, or things of that nature, then I hope you'll ask them in the moderated Q&A session. Nobody really needs for me to speak much longer because everybody's really interested in the science I know. And so with that, I'm going to give five additional minutes to the panelists um, and we'll kick things off. Leave our first person up is uh, Professor Yavin Lee from University of Washington. And uh, Yavin, please. Thank you, Ethan, for the introduction. I will share my presentation. Okay. All right. 
Um, it's a great honor to present our SDN T11 production activities at the University of Washington during this virtual seminar. Um, my presentation will cover four main topics. First, I will begin with a background slide summarizing the unique properties that make acetin a great candidate for targeted apotherapy. Then I will discuss the methods we use for routine production, followed by our quality control methods and product, uh, product specifications. Finally, um, I will give an update on our current development activities aimed at improving acetin production. Um, let me start with the unique properties of acetin T11 for targeted alpha therapy. Um, acetin emits high energy alpha particles that have a short range in tissue and can deliver a high dose of radiation to the tumor while sparing surrounding healthy tissue. Um, the shorter 7.2 hour half-life can potentially provide lower toxicity compared with other alpha emitters with longer half-lives. Uh, moreover, acetin 211 does not have any uh, alpha emitting decay daughter, which is excellent for reducing off target toxicity. Acetin 211 is perhaps the easiest to produce among all the alpha emitters that are currently being considered for targeted alpha therapy. Um, the production only requires a medium energy alpha beam. Um, the target material business is very easy to obtain at a low cost. Uh, finally, the labeling chemistry for incorporating acetin T11 into various carrier molecules has been established. At the University of Washington, um, we currently have two target systems for acetin production. The first is an external target that is irradiated at a 10 degree angle. Uh, this target developed in collaboration with Triumph but has a large business surface. It's a fully stopping target containing approximately 4.25 grams of bismuth metal. Um, the target fabrication process involves melting high purity bismuth onto an aluminum target body, followed by machining to the desired thickness. For routine production, we employ a wet chemistry method to isolate acetin from irradiated bismuth targets. Uh, the target dissolves in concentrated nitric acid, which is then distilled away, and the remaining bismuth salt and acetin T11 are redissolved in 8 molar HCl. Then acetin T11 is extracted into diisopropyl ether DIPE and we uh, wash the DIPE layer four times with eight molar HCl to remove residual bismuth salt. Finally, acetin T11 is back extracted into sodium hydroxide, resulting in a final product volume of around half a mil. Acetin is then neutralized for radio labeling experiments or for shaping. Generally, this manual process takes about two and a half hours providing a non-decay corrected yield of about 60%. For quality control, um, radio TLC tests are used to verify the acetin species uh, um, is um, a sodium acetate and uh, um, the uh, radiochemical purity is higher than uh, 85%. We also use HPGE detectors to uh, check for radionucleidic and radioisotopic purity ensuring that um, acetin 210 or other radionuclides are absent, absent in the product. Our acetin 211 production has more than doubled since our first clinical trial started in 2017. Um, more than um, two curies of um, acetin 211 was produced in each year over the uh, last five years. However, we anticipate a lower total activity this year uh, due to a pause in an acetin clinical trial pending FDA review of current results. As part of the DOE isotope network, our mission is to provide acetin to other US investigators through the NIDC. We can ship 14 to 50 millicurie at a time using FedEx overnight. Um, although um, only about 10% of the shipped quantity remains after overnight shipment. 
uh, for local customers near Seattle, we can arrange a courier for faster delivery. Our current production capacity allows for one acetine run per week with possibility of a second run depending on our schedule. Um, we ship acetine in a near neutral solution in a plastic V bottom vial, um, typically containing 0.6 to 0.7 milliliter. Now I'm going to switch my focus to our R&D activities. Uh, the UW Psychotron, uh, the UW Medical Psychotron team has uh, recently designed a new target station, um, which is optimized for SD211 production, as mentioned by Ethan. Um, this target station is available um, for, for other groups uh, through licensing. Uh, this picture shows the target station installed at the end of the beam line. Um, uh, this target station is designed to withhold up to 100 microamp of 29 MeV alpha beam, automatically load and eject targets, be compatible with com commercial remote target transfer systems, adaptable for other isotope production targets and cost effective to fabricate and maintain. I will use a couple of short videos to show you this new target station. Um, if you have any uh, specific questions, please reach out to Marisa, the co-director of UW Medical Psychotron Facility. Her uh, email address is at the bottom uh, of this slide. Okay. The first video shows a target being loaded from the magazine. Um, and um, moved to the irradiation position. And in the second video, uh, we can see after the irradiation, uh, the target being re uh, moved to the ejection position and ejected into a, um, a pig uh, through a funnel. Okay, our group have um, developed and reported on a new acetine isolation method that uses tellurium pa metal packed columns. In this method, we use 10 molar nitric instead of concentrated nitric for target dissolution. Additionally, the nitric acid distillation step uh, is, is replaced by a matrix conversion step where hydroxylamine hydrochloride is used to destroy the nitrate. The tellurium column separation steps, uh, step proves to be uh, highly efficient, providing decay corrected isolation yields of approximately 95% and non decay corrected yields of around 90%. The semi automated process we reported takes about one and a half hours, generating a product of about one mil of sodium hydroxide solution. The product does contain a small amount of tellurium impurity, which appears not to affect radio labeling. Although the product can potentially have hydroxylamine breakthrough, we have monitored hydroxylamine contamination using an HPLC method that our group developed. Um, we have not observed the breakthrough so far. Um, the radiochemical purity of the product is consistently high with antibody labeling yields averaging around 70 to 80 percent, which is similar to what we typically achieve when using the wet chemistry product for labeling. This year, we obtained new equipment for the automation of the tellurium column method. The new system we got has three positive displacement pumps and six multi-position valves. The pumps and valves have been integrated together and the integrated unit measures nine inches by 13 inches by 11 inches. We program our isolation protocol through the graphic interface that came, came with the system um, to use it for acetine production. In our recent efforts to optimize the automated process, we have focused on minimizing the volume of the product. Initially, we tried to flush the column with air before eluding with sodium hydroxide. Um, this approach successfully allowed us to elute essentially all the activity in the first half a mil, uh, half milliliter. However, 
it appears that the air used to blow the column also caused oxidation of the uh, acetine, negatively affecting our labeling efficiency. We, we are now evaluating the use of argon rather than air for removing water from the column and tubing. Additionally, we've been working on adapting the tellurium column method for the new 90 degree target system. Uh, the target features a bismuth layer with a thickness of about 90 micrometers, specifically designed to capture the 29 to 21 MeV uh, a window of the S18T11 excitation function. And the bismuth surface mirrors um, uh, 80 millimeter in diameter, and the total bismuth is only about uh, 230 milligram. The small target mass could um, potentially um, simplify the separation chemistry. We have conducted 30 runs to date using this target, producing uh, 15 to 30 millicuries per batch for preclinical animal studies. The production rate achieved is um, comparable to the larger 10 degree angle target. Um, it should be Noted that uh, one practical difference between the fully stopping target and this one is that we need to wait for about 30 minutes after EOB to retrieve the new target due to the um, significant production of short-lived radioisotopes in the aluminum target backing. In order to use the new S18 target with our automated system, we're developing a new target dissolution chamber. And this slide shows a prototype target dissolution chamber designed and fabricated by Bob Smith uh, in our um, cyclotron team. For this design, the flow is through the center port to the four exit ports. This prototype is currently being tested in our lab. In summary, at the University of Washington, uh, we routinely produce up to two uh, curies of S18 per year. Um, our ongoing efforts include evaluating a new target system and optimizing an automated isolation process. We thank the DOE Isotope Program for their support and thank you all for your attention. Um, I will be happy to take any questions during the Q&A session. Okay, Jacob, do you have the uh, agenda? Perfect. Uh, next up on our list um, is Professor Sherry Anello from Texas A&M University. Um, Sherry, please take it away. Hi, everybody. Um, so I. I'd like to thank the, the DOE for putting this together. That was, and, and I really appreciate the last talk because that saves me a lot of trouble on the introduction. Very nice um, understanding of why we even really care about astatine. And you'll see that we've, we've uh, working on adopting their target and lots, lots of overlap with, with what's going on in Seattle. Um, so at Texas A&M, we have one of those five cyclotrons that Ethan mentioned that can can make it. And this is actually a machine that was built in the 1960s um, to do fundamental basic nuclear science by the Atomic Energy Commission in the state of Texas and the Welch Foundation. Um, it sits at the core of our facility and you can see a picture of it here. Um, and then what we've done is taken this, I don't, you can't see my mouse. Mm, anyway, um, what? Yes, we can. Oh, you can see my mouse. Okay, great. So we've so we've taken we have this beam line that then goes through a magnet and goes to the rest of the facility for fundamental nuclear science, and we have mounted right on the back of it um, a small chamber where we could put our bismuth target, which you can see here in this picture. And we'll talk about some of the other little things that are on this chamber as as we go along. Oh, wait. Okay. So um, just to, to, to our process for processing targets is a little bit different than, than that that was developed in, in Seattle. So I just wanna go ahead and tell you a little bit about what we do. So we have again, this, this, this natural bismuth target. Um, okay, bombarded with 28.8 .8 MeV alpha particles. Um, we generally um, put the beam on and irradiate um, 
overnight and then we pull it early in the morning so that we can we can ship as we as we pull it out we dissolve in six to eight molar nitric acid um the the bismuth target and then we load it right onto um an extraction chromatography column the the astatine stays on the column the bismuth is eluded off and then we can dry the column and then what we ship is is a dry column rather than 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 a liquid in a vial. Okay, so just to go back a little bit to how we got to the the column that we use and the separation we use was um, John Burns, who you'll hear from next, um, used to be here at Texas A and M, and was the the architect behind realizing that. Um, ketones interact really well with astatine and bismuth doesn't care about, about these organics. So um, we've used the idea of the liquid-liquid extraction to, to basically realize that these ketones do a really great job of, of separating out the bismuth from, from the astatine. And you could read the details in his paper from a few years ago. But basically using this concept, we then put it onto a column. And so these are homemade columns where we, we take sort of a standard um, uh, bead, dry it out so that you have all these nice little nooks and crannies. And then we put our three octanone into all of these little nooks and crannies because the astatine likes to hang on to that three octanone. The bismuth doesn't care about it. So we have many, many theoretical plates in our column, which lets us get great separation. We've chosen, although there are various different things we have looked at in the batch studies, the three octanone, because this is an FDA approved um, agent. So just to show you what some of that looks like, here are some details of this. And I've tried to put references here if you look at the slides to see some of the details, but um, the, the column that we're using actually is, is this column right here. As I said, it's the three octanone impregnated uh, Abercrombie CG300. Um, it's got a bed, we use bed volume of a half a milliliter. And what you see that's really sort of important is that you flush through here all of your impurities, and then you 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 pull out in the first two bed volumes really all of the astatine or most of the astatine. You get a little left on the column, but but most of it comes out in here, which gives which means you've got it in one milliliter. So that's the same thing that that they were talking about, is trying to um have less volume to have your activity in. Um, this is a fairly rapid thing because we don't dry it and 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 dry do go through a dry down. It is just the nitric acid solution that runs through our column. So from the time we get the uh, target to having the astatine on a column ready to go is really less than twenty minutes. Now we do also use. Um, a, a thin target where the we're depositing the excess energy into the aluminum backing. So we do have a little bit of that cool down that you just heard about before we extract the target, because right now we're manually extracting it. We um, are looking forward to the time when we just pneumatically ship it to the, the, um, the lab and we, we won't be as worried about that. Um, we have, yeah. Okay. Um, so just to show kind of some of our uh, ramp up in the in the production of astatine. So we didn't do any of this before Ethan um, really launched the university network. We kind of came into the university network in in the the about 2020, I think it was right. So so 1920 we started um, sporadically trying to make some astatine, but we are now sort of regularly making 60 to 100 millicuries when we do an irradiation. Um, so one of the things. That, that I think Ethan referred to was sort of trying to get this network of places because astatine only has this seven hour half-life. And so certainly um, Seattle is well positioned because they've got trials going on right there. They've got chemists, they've got all of Seattle and you know it doesn't take that long to move the astatine down the hall to the, to the, the preclinical trial or the clinical trial. But um, MD Anderson, which is in Houston, is a long way from Seattle, but it is not that far from College Station. So this this um, 
location of us relative to Houston, I think might have been part of the attractiveness of, of Ethan wanting us to get into this game. And, you know, it really should only take two hours as long as the courier doesn't decide to stop for lunch. Um, so what we do then is we take this column, and I showed you that column a minute ago, and we put it in a baggie, and then we put it in lots of baggies, and we we check it all along the way, and it goes into, um, a, it, it used to go into a cardboard box and then literally just get driven down to Houston, which, you know, shouldn't take two hours. Um, what we now do is actually put it in a, in a type A package so that it's it's it, regulatorily it's easier to ship because if we go over ten millicuries it's not a it's not a shipping issue. But also John Burns, which you'll hear from next, has moved to um, UAB, and so with him over here, it's a lot harder to actually drive from College Station to UAB. So we are now the colloquium will begin in 30 minutes in the seminar room. I'm sorry about that. Um, so since John is now at UAB, we actually ship overnight to John with FedEx. And most of the time FedEx gets it there once it's gotten hung up in, in Memphis. Um, and so we hear that's an issue for other people as well. But we are prepared to, as soon as the lawyers um, finish their um, discussions, let's say, um, could ship sort of to that distance. Again, the overnight shipping, as was pointed out, you, you lose significant amounts in the overnight ship because of the, the, the decay time. Um, when it gets to MD Anderson, we have collaborators down there and Ricardo has been working at labeling things that I'm not going to tell you about, but just to show that the labeling works once it's gone through our chemical process, he has done this demonstration with aniline, and you can see the the comparison to to a, an iodo complex, where you see the the complex labeled here, and then what happens when you actually do it with astatine. So that's very nice to have shown that once we go through our process, you you still can do the the, the radio labeling with it. When it gets to UAB, John will tell you about that next. But this is just one slide that kind of shows you again, we after we ship the columns overnight, basically John gets everything off in those first two fractions, and then he does great things with it. So we have had this automated dissolution set up for, for a while, and, and we're still working on, um, always working on trying to improve things, but, but I think this is uh, perhaps not that different from from what we saw in the last presentation, which is it's controlled by by a PC and it's got the valves so that we can um, once we put the target in, we can remotely put the nitric acid into our dissolution chamber. We can pull the product out. We can put it onto the column and we can do all of that remotely. This is a very nice work by by Evgeny, who is our architect of this. Um, if you're interested, you can read more about um, some of what we've done. We've got a few highlights out there, and I think there's one more in the in the works. Or you can read some of the the recent papers out of out of our group. Um, just to give you a, a little bit of where we're headed, um, like I said, we we have um, Ada, which is our automated dissolution setup, working, but. Um, always working on improving to, and in, in this case, particularly to be able to go to, to multiple columns. Um, this is the, the target that you just saw, actually the video of working. Um, so we, we have um, constructed a, one of those from the blueprints. Thank you, Seattle. Thank you, Ethan, for facilitating this. We are working on trying to make it work for us, doing some, some technical improvements and, and getting it adapted to our beam line. So I hope that we'll have that in place soon. The other advancement that, that we're working on here is, I didn't talk about the sources. So we, we feed our machine with both um, a, a, a bucket source, a negative ion source, and an ECR. And there's a difference in, in emittance between the two sources and in, in trying to get uh, more intensity um, through the machine, we decided that we would buy a new negative ion source. So we have purchased this source from DPACE, and it is in-house now. 
um, probably will not get mounted to the cyclotron until we go into shutdown because obviously we want to run the machine when when we can. So so I'm looking forward to seeing this um, new source actually operate on our machine. We should get some higher currents out and then hopefully we'll be able to increase our activity even above that 100 millicurie where, we, where we've been at. And of course, Ethan already mentioned, we're working on being able to deliver to more of you through the NIDC as soon as the lawyers get done. Um, so obviously this is not my work. This is the work of a large group of people, um, both those of us in, in the core astatine group, um, Rad Safety, the accelerator physicists, a whole crew of, of great people here at AM. Um, not possible without lots of money going into this, notably Ethan um, and the isotope program, but also other um, people have come to the table to sort of help make this program work. And I couldn't end without saying I'd be happy to take questions either about our science or about HIPPO now or in the, in the um, panel. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sherry. Um, a pleasure as always. And uh, I love the hippo slide. Um, moving right along, uh, let's turn it over to Professor John Burns at uh, University of Alabama, Birmingham. Um, John, what have you got that's fun and exciting to share with us? Thank you, Ethan, uh, for both the invitation and uh, the introduction. Um, I am John Burns. I'm an assistant professor here at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. And uh, I would like to talk a little bit about the, the work we've been doing, trying to better understand the chemical behavior of astatine from both a separation standpoint, as well as a research and potentially uh, an application into um, therapy. And so um, with that, I would like to just talk a little bit about the background of astatine before I get started, we've, we've already heard about the unique decay properties, but one thing I think sometimes we lose sight of is that astatine has a really interesting location on the periodic table. It sits right down here in the halogen series, and I pulled this periodic table from the American Chemical Society. They've colored it this blue color, but um, I think what we're learning as a community and more and more of us are sort of moving to this direction, is that acetine probably ought to be colored gray, like some of these other on the metalloid stair step. And it actually has quite a bit of metal character, which influences the way we handle it, the way we use it. And so I would like to sort of uh, talk about what we've been learning in that area. So, um, you know, we are working off of the platform that um, has built by by others. So there's a really great group in France, um, Julian Champ Champion, and some of her uh, group have done some really great work looking at the speciation of astatine in the aqueous phase. Um, and so if we think about what we're, we're talking about, we have bismuth targets that we're dissolving in nitric acid. So we're in this really low pH range, high oxidation potential. In fact, one molar nitric acid would be right here at this tick mark. Uh, it's believed that acetine forms this really interesting uh, species, acetine monooxide positively charged cation. Okay, and so this is a really unique species. There's a handful of other metals, vanadium, titanium, that form monooxide species in so aqueous solution and are stable, uh, but they're both divalent cations. So acetine is the only one that's a monovalent cation. And so if you think about what the electronic structure is and how uh, bonding might take place with a metal center that has this sort of speciation, you would draw a molecular orbital diagram that sort of looks like this, right? And this is very similar to dioxygen where the frontier orbital, the highest mo occupied molecular orbital is this anti-bonding pi system where we have two unpaired electrons uh, distributed across two degenerate orbitals. Well, that's a great uh, cyst model, except for the fact that acetine turns out to be very heavy. It's a large uh, atom. And so we have to take into things into account things like relativistic effects of the core electrons, as well as spin over coupling, which causes the standard uh, electronic structure to be perturbed. And we actually break the degeneracy of the pi system. And so we go from two unpaired electrons, which we would call a triplet state, 
down to a, a pseudo closed shell system where the, now the electrons are paired in a singlet state. And this has implications on what kind of bonding can take place. And so uh, a couple of years ago now, we, we showed this in collaboration with Mike Hall, who is a theoretical chemist at Texas A&M and his group, where we, we asked them to look into the bonding mechanism of what a ketone might interact with this acetine monooxide species. And they found that the ketone comes in in this bent conf configuration, which is really indicative of lone pair donation. And in fact, the DFT calculation showed that we had a, a donor acceptor interaction and the acceptance uh, site was into this previously unoccupied empty pi orbital, okay? And so this is really fascinating. And so we said, okay, if this is the bond that's taking place, can we as scientists manipulate this bond? And so we, we looked at trying to change the electronic structure of our ketones to do this. And so Sherry mentioned earlier um, that we have been using 3-octanone as our extractant. It works really great. It's got this alkyl chain. If we replace that with an aromatic system like a phenyl ring here, we delocalize the electronic structure of the molecule and we allow the electronic cloud to move a little bit more freely. And since oxygen is electronegative, it will pull electron density onto this oxygen and it will increase the electron density in the lone pairs that sit on that ketone oxygen. And so if our binding mode is actually um, following what we think it is, we should see increased D values because if you remember, uh, bonding is directly proportional to electron density between two nuclei. And so if we have more electron density here, then we would uh, assume that there would be a stronger bond. And we can actually measure that in the D values, um, seeing how acetine extracts differently between these two um, uh, species. And so here's the data. This is um, the log of the D value on the uh, Y axis. And this on the X axis is the log of the ketone concentration. And we adjusted this by simply um, diluting these things with toluene, which doesn't extract acetine uh, very readily. And so you can see here, uh, or one more thing I should mention that the slope of these lines represent the stoichiometry number between the extractant and acetine. And they're all one, so we have a one-to-one -one relationship between acetine and our ketones. So, but if you look at the overall magnitude of the D values for three octanone, they're much lower than that of acetophenone which has this uh, increased electron density on the oxygen. So, okay, great. We were really excited about this. Seems like we're understanding what's taking place. So we said, what if we change our extractant from this uh, single ketone to a diketone? Then we should have chelation take place and we should see the D values just jump through the roof because um, we would be bonding through multiple sites. And unfortunately that's not what we saw. So here's the data. It shifted a little bit uh, on the on the figure, but that's simply because uh, dibenzylmethane is less soluble in toluene than acetophenone, so we had to work at a lower ketone concentration. But if you look at the trend lines and sort of extend them, you see that these two data sets actually fall almost on top of one another, which is indicative of having very similar bonding. So we were a little bit um, uh, frustrated with that result, but we actually have um, some nice results that I'll talk about in the next slide. If you increase this bridge between the two ketones from a methyl group to a propyl group uh, or even a, a butyl group, you introduce a lot of flexibility between the two binding sites. And that's when we saw this huge jump in D value. Okay, so we said, well, perhaps there is some chelation taking place after all. And so again, we went um, to our friends in the theoretical space, uh, Mike Hall and his group and asked, can, can, we, can you help us understand exactly what's going on in the binding? So they did some more DFT calculations for us. Acetophenone showed a very similar bent configuration into the acetine uh, metal center. The eel oxygen is here, and they, there's a, a charge balanced nitrate here. The uh, uh, dibenzylmethane showed something very interesting. So it's a little bit hard to see, but here's the first carbon eel oxygen right here. And the other one comes here, back here, and points away. So the low energy conformer for these types of molecules has the partially negatively charged oxygen repelling the other partially negatively charged oxygen. And to bring that back around costs quite a bit of energy from an entropy standpoint. And so you just don't get that energy back from binding with acetine because remember we have to have this bent 
confirm confirmation to get a, a bond formation and the molecule is just too uh, sterically hindered to allow for that. But as you increase the flexibility of the ligand, we see other uh, bonding modes. It was kind of interesting with the propane group here, we have a phenyl cation interaction, which is, is quite interesting. Uh, when you get to the, the butyl group though, you get that second oxygen coming in and binding to the acetine. And this resulted in the lowest delta G values, um, which corresponded very nicely with the experimental data uh, that we had. So we were excited about that. Another uh, system that we've been looking at, and this has been uh, pioneered by Evgeny, is to try to understand what the thermodynamics of extraction is. So Evgeny looked at a system where we had one octanol as our um, organic phase, and we were extracting acetine out of different nitric acid concentrations. And so here, the, the blue-purple dots is the experimental data, and this uh, red line here is the thermodynamic model to fit the data. And so Evgeny was able to derive this uh, equation here where we got a really great fit um, for the data. And from that, we were able to uh, determine things like uh, the constant of extraction of acid, trivalent acetine as the, the monooxide species bound to the nitrate moving across the phase boundary into the organic phase. So we were able to calculate that with some uh, pretty good certainty. Uh, we're also, it was interesting, there's this interesting trend where we have extraction, high D values at low acidities, and as you increase the acidity, it comes down. So this is believed to be caused by uh, acid-induced reduction of acetine 3 to acetine 1. And in fact, we were able to, to calculate what that constant is. And then uh, we were also able to calculate what the binding constant is for acetine, trivalent acetine as the monoxide species with nitrate. Now, what is really interesting is when we included a similar binding constant for monovalent acetine with nitrate, the, the fit just went uh, wild and didn't fit the data at all. And so this is really indicative that monovalent acetine has a very, very low binding with nitrate. So it's similar to something like sodium. And so that's, that's interesting. Another set of systems that we've been looking at is the partitioning across phase boundaries, um, not a liquid-liquid phase boundary, but a solid liquid phase boundary using some standard ion exchange resins. And so the two that I want to talk about this afternoon are using DAOX50, which is a you know, run-of-the-mill workhorse ion exchange resin that has a sulfate group here as the active site, and an MP-thiol resin, which has, instead of a sulfate, has a sulfur, a thiol group here. And so this will tell us something about the hard soft character of acetine. And what we see is that the, the KD values in this case for the MP thiol are much, much higher than that for the standard DAOX resins. And so this tells us that acetine has a lot of soft character, um, which is not surprising, I guess. It's at the bottom of the periodic table, way down at the right. And so what we were able to actually demonstrate how different the character is. Another really interesting thing from this data, we were able to derive the ion exchange constants for both trivalent acetine and monovalent acetine. And in both cases for the amphithiol and the DAOX, the monovalent acetine had much, much higher extraction values than the trivalent. And this, again, uh, I guess intuitively makes sense. If you look at the trivalent species, we have this polar negatively charged oxygen head that is really going to work against you in a, in a cation exchange resin where you have the negatively charged active sites. And so you would imagine that it has to come in at a very distinct orientation to bind here while the spherical um, monovalent cation can bind in any conformation that it enters the resin in. So this was really great work um, from this data and some other data that I didn't show. But uh, as Sherry said, if you're interested, the, the references are here. We've been able to derive speciation diagrams of acetine in both the nitric acid media and chloride media, where we can predict with a pretty high level of certainty what the species is going to be in a given uh, system. And what's really interesting, if you look here, the uh, x-axis are much different orders of magnitude, showing that chloride complexes tend to be very, very strongly formed with the trivalent acetine. So you can even make at very low chloride concentrations these negatively charged an uh, molecular anions. Um, so just to sort of wrap it up where we're going from here, 
uh, we're really interested in um, further exploring how these ketone bonds are made and manipulating them through um, adding electron donating or withdrawing groups to uh, the ligands themselves to find out if we can really uh, push or pull these uh, bonds. We are really fascinated by the, the soft character of acetine that was displayed um, with the MP thiol resin. And so we're looking at other functional groups, nitrogens, other sulfurs, uh, phosphorus groups to better understand the binding character of acetine. And then of course, we are uh, very actively pursuing what is um, the result of acetine being shipped and the chemical behavior on that. So Sherry showed the slide that Ricardo had uh, labeled um, al an alanine derivative with acetine. Um, and so we have seen that if you're doing labeling reactions, they seem to work okay. Um, some of the other chemical uh, systems, acetine seems to behave a little bit differently after shipment. And so we are, we are actively pursuing that. And of course, um, this is a very collaborative project. Uh, we do not have one of those five cyclotrons that Ethan uh, mentioned, but we do have friends that have them. And so we're very grateful for that relationship. Um, and uh, of course, we uh, are grateful to the isotope program for their support in various capacities. Um, specifically through the Early Career Award and the HIPPO uh, funding. Um, Neumott is a graduate student in my lab. She is uh, working on the acetine, and Avinash is a postdoc. He's also working on the acetine project. And uh, Jehan is a new graduate student who will begin doing some acetine work. So I'd be happy to answer any questions at the end of the session. Um, and please do not hesitate to reach out to me by email if you have any other questions. Thank you very much for that. Right. Thank you, John. Um, next up, uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit. Um, and we're going to hear from Dr. Brenda Sandmeyer, who's a clinician at the Fred Hutchison Cancer Research Center in Seattle. Uh, so we're going to get a nice clinical perspective. Uh, Brenda, are you there? Brenda? Yeah, sorry. When I shared my screen, um, it covered up all my little um, speaker and video, but here I am now. Is yeah. this look okay? Uh, so we can see you. We don't have you sharing yet. Oh, well, okay. Let's do it again. Share. How's that? Perfect. Correct orientation. Go ahead. Now I just got to move the other part back. Hang on to the top. Well, thank you very much, Ethan, for the invitation. And I really like hearing about all the progress that's being made and um, being okay. able to produce astatine to 11 as one of the limitations with any clinical use is um, you can't have a situation where patients can only go to one place. You need it where um, it'd be reasonable that at least throughout the U.S., if we're talking about U.S. production, that we'd be able to offer um, clinical treatments to patients and centers of excellence. And I mean, plural centers, not just one or two. So all that you presented so far is very exciting. Um, I'm at uh, Fred Hutch and I work with the group and been collaborating for years, for decades with the group at UW. And I upfront wanna say, I like to acknowledge that collaboration as that's not possible without it. Um, just to give a little introduction about hematopoietic cell transplantation. Uh, we use this in, in all patients, but using this in older patients with diseases such as acute le leukemia is a missed opportunity uh, because of some inequities on in how we treat older patients with um, malignant diseases. And ongoing research in the transplant community is to better study some of these older patients. And one of the big areas of research I've been involved in is reduce intensity conditioning to minimize toxicity by enhancing transplant efficacy in older adults. And just to give you a brief clinical background for ages of, of bloodborne cancers, you can see with the exception of um, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which is primary pediatric disease. Most of these diseases happen in patients as they age out. 
and just looking at AML as that's one of the most common um, of diseases that we do transplants for is 60% of cases occur in patients who are age 65 and older. And if you look at outcomes of survival, this is unrelated to whether they're transplanted or not, just looking at SEER data and looking at survival, if um, your survival also is not as good um, if you happen to be in the older age group. And one of that is, is because of limitations of more toxic treatments in the older patient group. And the types of patients that come for transplant is either if nothing else works uh, and advanced leukemias. And sometimes we do it when we'd like to do it, um, when they're in remission, if they're high risk. But then there are also patients that um, present with ongoing disease. And the aim is really to replace disease marrow with normal marrow from a healthy donor. And the chemo radiation that's given up front destroys disease marrow and also suppresses the patient's immune cells so that the marrow graft will be accepted. And we use a healthy marrow graft. Um, it could be from peripheral blood or from a bone marrow harvest to really replace um, the disease marrow and do the production of normal cells like red cells, white cells, and platelets. Here's a little pie chart that talks about where are the obstacles of success in transplant. And if you look on the right, um, you will see the dark blue. If you look at patients who die after transplant, over half is relapse of their primary disease, indicating that we have room to go to in our pre-transplant conditioning of chemotherapy or radiation um, to reduce this risk of relapse. This is a very, very old study, and this is an update that was published in 1998. And if you look at the age group, the median age group of the patients was 25. And I'm saying that majority of leukemia occurs in patients in their fifth, sixth, and seventh decade. But this is a study where we did high dose radiation, seven times 2.25 gray versus six times two gray. Um, and this is again, total body radiation. And um, during the, this time period, when this was done, this is done with cobalt. Um, you see the risk of relapse is higher. And all of these patients were transplanted in remission without any evidence of disease. And if, however, this came at a cost that with the higher dose radiation, there was toxicity. And so we knew that probably if you radiate other normal organs, such as lung, liver, et cetera, it came with a cost. And so the standard nowadays, if you're doing what's considered high dose total body radiation would be um, six times two or 12 grade TBI. And so if we can make transplants safer, more effective, we'll access improve for older adults. And that's why we went to um, radio immunotherapy, um, and our center at Fred Hutch, we've been doing that um, since the late 1980s, preclinical and then clinical in the 90s. And really it's to thinking there's a reduction of late toxic effects from that you get with um, gamma radiation with TBI and allow us to treat medically infirmed patients and potentially reduce secondary cancers. And we can give higher doses of radiation to areas to control disease and also target the immune cells for engraftment. And you can not just use one antibody but um, target, but you can do multiple different ones to either um, target specific types of malignant cells or just panhematopoietic or T cells, for example. And uh, why I'm going to present some data on the CD45 antigen, which we have the most expensive. Um, most extensive experience. And it's expressed on almost all white blood cells. So that would be all your marrow cells and peripheral blood cells and the majority of acute leukemias and myelodysplastic syndrome. And it's absent from non-hematopoietic tissues, though some non-classic -hemat hematopoietic tissues do have hematopoietic cells that reside in them. This is the studies looking initially um, some old trials, but using I-131, where we did um, 
uh, biodistribution, calculated a dose, gave a therapeutic dose, and this was somewhere about two weeks out with I-131 because of the longer half-life. And then just generic chemo that we would give for a reduced intensity transplant, transplanted patients, and um, most of the, many of them had refractory or active disease. And these are patients that we would not take to transplant because they would be considered ineligible. And if you look at them, um, you see four or five years out that there's probably about 35 to 40% long-term disease survival. And if with a standard transplant, it would probably be somewhere between 10 and 15%. But again, many of these patients, we wouldn't have transplanted them with a standard transplant. So these results were encouraging and went on to a phase three trial with I-131-based antibodies. We also did a smaller study with Itrium-90, which is, again, another um, beta emitter and um, had similar results. And again, these were older patients, median age of 62, showing proof of principle. But again, it still had the limitations of uh, the high dose beta emitters with um, a delay and when you can transplant them, you have to give it so that the ice, there's time for the isotope to decay before you can put in fresh new hematopoietic cells. And so that's when we went to astatine and I don't need to focus on this. And in our mouse studies, we showed that um, yields high myelosuppression. This is looking at mice marrow and you see even within 24 hours, you see um, knockout of cells. And um, here's blood counts on these mice with a dose escalation that we performed, um, showing that you get uh, white cells that are decreased and platelet counts that decrease. My cat's deciding he's wanting to meow. Um, I talked about mice. Anyhow, um, acetine has low toxicity, at least in the mouse, when we looked at um, the AST, BUN, ALT, and creatinine. And then at that time, we were also doing studies with um, bismuth 213, and this had a more favorable profile. And we used it as a translational animal in dogs doing, um, I a, you know, be the equivalent of a matched sibling transplant and saw that we had good engraftment. And this was a dose escalation. Here is uh, the CD45 antibody distribution in marrow and lymph nodes um, that we did an alpha camera imaging showing the distribution in areas of lymphocyte in the lymph nodes and throughout the marrow, the dark spot in the bone marrow, which is panel C and F, are the areas of bone spicules where you would not expect to see distribution. So um, the points for translation, um, probably don't need to belabor this other than we were able with our collaboration with our UW group, um, the all and e is working with, uh, we were able to uh, work out all the logistics and treat our first patient in 2017. And again, um, sort of the involvement, University of Washington producing materials, Fred Hutch Biologic producing BC8 is the antibody with the B10 um, on it, is produced in the, um, based on the technology developed at UW. And when we get the astatine on the same day the patient's infused, it's labeled and administered to the patient. And then the transplant is basically, we want to um, study is to figure out the uh, maximum tolerated dose. And always, you know, these are for phase one studies, first in human, is to see what the toxicity it is. And secondarily, of course, clinically, we're interested in disease response and engraftment. Because there's still the question, could this you know, high energy radiation dose damage the marrow microenvironment and impact engraftment? Because some previous work that we did with um, Holmium and Samarium showed, in, at least in a dog model, it caused marrow fibrosis. And so 
this was always going to be a question when you're putting a new isotope into patients. And the criteria was basically adults, high risk patients. The only limitation was they couldn't have too many marrow blasts, peripheral blasts in their blood, um, as that we thought it would sort of soak up the antibody isotope without allowing any to get to the bone marrow. And here's the treatment schema, very simple. Um, initially, we didn't do any biodistribution. We're um, dosing on a per kilo ideal body weight of the antibody and the isotope. And the fludarabine at low dose TBI is our standard mini transplant that we knew would um, allow successful engraftment. And here we've treated 45, and here's the first 36 where we did dose escalation to 17 and a fixed dose in 19 patients. Median age was 62 and the oldest was 74. Some of them had a prior high dose transplant and um, they're mainly diseases of the marrow, AML, MDS, and ALL. And only of the 36, only two were in what would be considered a remission. The other patients had minimal residual disease, or um, which we sometimes would transplant, not always, and definitely having more than 5% blast in the marrow, none of these patients would be eligible for a transplant. And I think this is sort of illustrative of the effect of the antibody isotope in the patients that had circulating blasts. And the, this is just done on um, CBCs, it's not flow-based data, but CBCs, morphologic blast in the blood. And we see with the exception of the one patient that got the lowest dose, patient one, we have clearance of the peripheral blood blast um, with just the antibody isotope given on day minus seven before the fludarabine or TBI. So the, um, this other patient eventually came down, but normally if you were to give the amount of fludarabine here, that would not clear away marrow blast, as fludarabine is primarily used to suppress T cells. And looking at survival after transplant, overall progression free, probably looks like it's coming out about 40% um, long term. Now, one of the um, other outcomes, though, we always have to talk about what's toxicity. Um, a subset of patients develop a complication, what's called veno-occlusive disease of the liver. Therefore, we put it on voluntary hold to determine the relationship to drug versus other causes. Um, we didn't hit um, the official stopping rules, but we put a pause on it because we knew that veno-occlusive disease would likely be um, the toxicity based on other radioimmunotherapy and also on high dose um, um, transplant protocols um, unrelated to radioimmunotherapy. You can get that with high dose chemo or high dose TBI. Another wrinkle was we were using one drug called Sirolimus, which is an immunosuppression drug um, that subsequently had been shown to cause more VOD in patients getting high dose total body radiation. So we thought the radiation that we're getting from acetine was high enough that it might cause a problem. And patients with high underlying liver problems, there are, and it sort of explains some of the biology, there are Kupfer cells in the liver, which are hematopoietic cells, and they line the venules in the liver. And so probably they're being targeted um, by the CD45 antibody contributing to this. So we changed the protocol to a lower dose level. We dropped it down two dose levels. We were at 550 microcuries per kilo, and we dropped it to 450. And we've instituted strict exclusion for history of liver problems and removed the serolimus. Um, when we got, FDA got those changes, whoops, um, they also had a partial hold put in because they wanted PK and dosimetry in a subset of patients. Interestingly, they asked this at the time in 2017 when we put in um, the IND. And we explained that, you know, we can't really do dosimetry of astatine 
um, due to uh, the fact that there's no imaging um, quality of it. And they accepted that back then, but since then the, their basic line, and I've heard for another couple studies that, you know, for a drug to get a label, they have to have PK and dosimetry. And so we're working this out, the logistics before we can reopen it. And the dosimetry will be done with I-131 um, as we have a lot of experience with it in all of our I-131 based CD45 trials. Now, donor options for underrepresented patients. I just talked about these are patients that have a matched donor, be it a brother or sister, though you can imagine if you're 70, you might not have a healthy donor and you need to get an unrelated donor anyhow. Um, if you happen to be Caucasian, your chance of getting a fully matched unrelated donor is 77%. But if you're have a, um, if you're an African American person, Asian, Pacific Islander, Hispanic, or American Indian or Alaska Native, your chances of a fully matched donor is much less in the unrelated donor registry. So we have this clinical trial, same thing, um, just slightly different here. The, um, the, the standard backbone is slightly different, but everything else is about the same. And we have 13 patients treat, um, treated so far and with similar results. Um, this uh, study did not include it in the whole. Now we also have a, non, a treatment for patients with non-malignant hematologic disorders and we're targeting um, patients, sorry, a little typo here, severe sickle cell disease as one of them. Um, these patients are can be very sick. They Before they would be a transplant candidate, they'd be ones that might have had partial strokes, they might have, um, you know, pulmonary emboli or other problems. So they're not a candidate to really get a high dose trans chemo transplant. But yet if you reduce the chemotherapy and the conditioning, they reject the graft because they've had so many blood transfusions. So we're doing this and we're using a fixed dose of the astatine, which in the preclinical model showed consistent engraftment in the dog model and following the patients. And we've treated two patients so far with um, very good results. Now there's a lot of um, excitement about some of the gene therapy studies. So obviously if the patients are, pri are prioritized for the other gene therapy, but the study is still open for the patients who don't qualify. So summary, in general, the radiomyotherapy is well tolerated and can give supplemented doses of radiation to leukemic sites. And the anti-leukemic potential may improve post-transplant outcomes. And these results support more radiomyotherapy-based transplant or other cellular therapy trials, such as conditioning for CAR-T and other targets for allow therapy in the non-transplant setting. Here's some areas of funding um, I got together of our Group, this does not include the UW based grants, and this is only a subset where we're using astatine um, as part of our grants. So it seems that the extramural funding sources are enthusiastic about this, which is encouraging. And here's some recently included, um, concluded grants. And as mentioned before, this is all a team effort when we're you know putting the patient in the center and um, takes a lot of people to do it, but it's very worthwhile and very satisfactory. And thank you, and I'll take questions at the end during the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, we're gonna move along to our last speaker before the moderated Q&A session. Um, looking for Xiaoyu Wu, please, from uh, Ionetics Corporation. Are you, are, you, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. All right, perfect. Take it away. All right, let me share my screen here. So you can see my screen, right? Correct, and you're in the correct orientation. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Ethan. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to give you an update 
of the Inetics Alpha program. Uh, David Eve has given a similar talk last year at this meeting and discussed overall strategies of Inetics Alpha program. I will concentrate on the recent progress in cyclotron R&D for commercial production of the STD-211 at Inetics. Okay, so. Okay. All right, so I borrowed the slide from David from last year's meeting. So this is a sort of a set up the background for this talk. There's a, everybody knows there's a grow, growing demand in TAT and raises the need for supply. And on this picture over here shows the five cyclotrons, I believe Ethan mentioned in his talk, University of Washington, Texas AM, and also UPenn over here. So I think uh, with Inetics, uh, you probably should add officially the six cyclotrons for astatine 211 production in the US. So this, uh, this is the pathways uh, David talked about the commercial production of Astatine 211. We want to set up a new facility in Lansing, Michigan, dedicated for high yield alpha isotope production. And the next, uh, you know, first step is using an existing cyclotrons followed by Eventually, we want to produce these regional production facilities distributed in the United States to supply, uh, expand this access and availability. And finally, we want to develop our own new uh, cyclotrons for isotope production as well. So this is the new Inetics TAT facility. And uh, again, so David shows this slide last time. This is in Lansing, Michigan. We acquired the site um, in March 2021, uh, roughly two and a half years ago. The idea would be we want to have the vault to host a cyclotron with the control rooms and the supply areas over here and with the office area in this place and eventually have a complete radiochemistry lab for target processing, radio labeling, and QA and QC functions. Uh, so that's a full function production facility. And this is a couple of pictures I just take recently from outside and from the top. And also this is uh, where the radio chemistry is currently being, being built. This picture is right along this hallway over here showing the separation between the QA, QC lab and the target processing area. Inetics uh, choosing to go with the cyclotron solutions for the uh, alpha emitter production, uh, mainly due to we have uh, this um, highly experienced uh, cyclotron R&D team uh, established and engaged in the cyclotron R&D since the beginning of the company. Uh, most of the psych physicists and engineers came from the Michigan State University, which has this national superconducting cyclotron lab uh, on site for about 50 years now. So at the beginning of the company, we, uh, we concentrate on developing these small cyclotrons over here. It's IN12SC, it's a superconducting 12 MeV proton machine uh, deliver about uh, 15, up to a 15 micron beam on a liquid target for nitrogen 13 ammonia production. So this machine, right now we have massively uh, produced this machine and installed many units on customer side in the United States. And also in the meantime, we were engaged in proton cancer therapy machine development as well. There are two machines we were involved in design fabrication and the production of this machine. These are typically 200 to 250 MeV proton machine with low intensity for cancer therapy. One of the machine, and this is SC240 machine has uh, multiple unit built and extracted beam uh, uh, produced already. And finally, 
for the alpha emitters, we're concentrated on developing, we have our own design of IN30SC, but we have chosen to go with uh, acquire an existing CS30 machine. And this is CS30 machine similar to Duke machine. Uh, we have uh, for the Astin 211 and also Actinium 225 production program. So this is the slide David showed last uh, in September 2022. Uh, what was the situation there? At that time, we have uh, stacked up the uh, magnet already, installed the coil, and mapped the magnetic field in May of 2022. And after that, we have built the cyclotron vault around the cyclotron. And uh, that work was pretty much com complete around August of 2022. These are the picture at the uh, user meeting last year. So during that time, uh, from June to December 2022, and we'll concentrate on building up all the subsystems of the CS30 cyclotron. So this cyclotron, probably you know, this is a decommissioned uh, CS30 unit from University of Michigan and put it in the storage in Tampa, Florida for many years before we put our hands on. So a lot of these subsystems, the parts has uh, uh, erosion and uh, rusting and some broken parts. We have to work into assembling and making new parts to make it work, including vacuum systems, RF systems, D. And here I'll just to show you the iron source, uh, refurbished iron source, which has the gas flow, cooling water, electric, electrical connections, and also under the vacuum. So we have to really revise these subsystem, including beam probe, it's a, a lot of a subsystem for us to put it together to make the cyclotron working properly. So that work was done pretty much uh, from June to December, 2022. And uh, all the subsystem was installed and the cyclotron commissioning starts in January of this year. And this is a picture of the cyclotron inside the vault. And you can see a little bit, this is the beam probe coming in from the side and the iron source insert uh, into the cyclotron. This one picture here is the control room. So we are actually using the, uh, our own control system, design our own control system for this cyclotron. The entire control pan panel is this touch screen with a couple of knobs over here. And this is the, engineering system we used it from the, our small cyclotron iron 12 sc so the control system is completely updated and we are using all the new uh, power supply all the lcw so the hardware is still the old the cs30 but a lot of new parts a new control system new supply uh, it's a new machine uh, uh, it should be a, a new machine so there's a lot of a technical area I don't have time to get into. A couple of highlights we did during the R&D phase. One is the we uh, did a, this D-voltage calibration with X-ray detectors. This is the picture showing the two acceleration Ds inside CS30. It is very important to understand how much the acceleration voltage you have in there. Typically people just put in the RF power and this calibration was never done. So we used the installed X-ray direct detectors to really understanding how much the voltage each of these D is creating once the power is applied from the cavity. And this is a sort of the result coming from that calibration. What we found out actually for the cyclotron we have, the acceleration voltage is slightly unbalanced one has a slightly higher D voltage than the other one. That's one thing we find out we have to compensate for this effect during the acceleration. And also there's a limitation how much power we can put in into this RF amplifier since it's an old system we furbished together. And uh, it is a lot lower than what Duke can achieve. So that's the limitation we found out for this cyclotron. That's one area. 
The other one is we have established a complete three-dimensional electric field and magnetic field uh, and uh, accelerated physics model. So we can track the particle from the ion source. So this is uh, gave us the guidance to really making the adjustment of the central region. This here shows the ion source, the polar, and also the D-tip of the cyclotrons. With this uh, beam sim simulation, we can make the adjustment to improve the beam transmission from the central region, which is very important to achieve the beam downstream uh, to the desired energy. And finally, as uh, you know, as I said, this is a very old machine. We put it together this RF amplifier with oscillator box and a resident box over here. There's a lot of parts, very old parts, absolutely obsolete. And we have to, uh, you know, try to salvage from uh, some of the spare part to get it working. So in order to really operating reliably, we actually invest the money, uh, redesign this RF uh, system amplifier, including the Ds. We'll build a new set of Ds uh, for the CS30. So the new system will be much more reliable and provide a higher acceleration power into the system and uh, is going to be improved the performance uh, in the future. So with that work, uh, and uh, uh, this is the commissioning result at uh, in March 24th of this year, we have successfully accelerated alpha particles about a 27 MeV on a, with a beam current about a 15 microns on the probe reaching radius of a 390 millimeters. And that's the first time we got in a successful beam, alpha beam accelerated to the full energy and full radius. And with that, we started putting into this internal target. Here shows the internal target insert in the place where the beam probe is. We move the probe to the other side. And this is the target head holding the aluminum target uh, uh, in this area over here. And this is the port where when you uh, pull out the target, you can replace the target and insert a new target, uh, open up the vacuum. So at the beginning, we put in this uh, carbon target in the target area to do the beam testing. This is the probe on the other side. You can see the tiny little beam spot on this uh, probe head over here. On this uh, picture over here, you can see the beam, uh, beam signals from the probe. The top one is without the probe in place. The probe is uh, completely retracted outside. And you can see when the beam is uh, pretty much uh, accelerate uh, without too much losses all the way until about 390, 400 millimeters before it started dropping off due to the magnetic field dropping, isochronous disappeared. And this is the curve showing you both the signal from the target as well as from the probe. Uh, at the beginning, you don't see anything on the target. Everything is on the probe. Once it started, you're pulling the probe out and you started to drop, see the current dropping on the probe and started taking the current on the target. Eventually, all the current, almost all the current is hitting the target. So that, after that test, we started putting into uh, uh, Bismuth's target. This is uh, on, down on April 6th. And we put a 50 micron uh, of Bismuth's target on this uh, aluminum target layer. And this is before the target was radiated inside the cyclotron. And this is the beam spot after the radiation on the target. So this is uh, after target, we did a, a activity test, uh, measured activity from the target. And this is what it looks like uh, the measurement uh, after end of the beam. And you can see this match up with the Asking 211 decay curve almost perfectly. And that was uh, uh, a very successful testing on produ uh, production of the uh, Asking 211 at Inetics for the first time. 
And we released a press, uh, we had a press released uh, in, Mar uh, in April of 2023. And um, I I'm sure everybody has seen this already. So let's go back to David's uh, talk. We have this uh, pass defined and uh, with what we have accomplished, we have accomplished the very first step as the 211 production, uh, this is step. And these following step is gonna be followed to reach the goal of uh, commercial production and the supply of the Aston 211. Of course, uh, you know, this is uh, the work of many, many people and including the, I, we have established this isotope production team at INEC is right now. And also we're expanding into the radiochemistry and the regulatory team. In addition, you know, we got a sub, many support from our Ionetics, uh, not only from the Ionetics, but also from Duke University as well, especially Sean and Michael. Uh, gave us a lot of a support uh, during the time we were operating this CS30 cyclotron. And with that, thank you very much. And if you have questions, uh, please contact me and also David Yeev. Thank you. Thank you, Shaul. Uh, okay, so we are incredibly on time, actually. Uh, and we're going to move into a moderated Q&A session. Um, nothing for any of you to do. Uh, but I would like to ask all of the panelists to uh, uh, turn their cameras back on. And there we go. OK. So we've got a few questions that have come in through the Q&A section. Um, if folks do have questions, please go ahead and, and populate that Q&A dialog in the, uh, the lower box. Uh, I think it's a second from the left in the middle section on your Zoom um, uh, dashboard, the bottom of your screen. Uh, go ahead and pop your questions into there, but I'm just gonna start going down the list of uh, those that are open. And then I'll read a couple that have uh, have been closed out. So first open question comes to us from Giuseppe LaRusso. Um, and he asks, does the bismuth uh, or the natural bismuth uh, alpha reaction produce any astatine 210? Um, Sherry, would you like to uh, would you like to answer that, please? You're muted. I mean, yeah, you'd think I would be better at that this far into the pandemic or out of the pandemic. Um, so I, I think the important thing is that the, the production of the astatine 211 is, is an alpha 2N reaction. So this is the excitation function, which is just the cross section as a function of, of the energy for that reaction. The astatine 210 is a higher energy reaction because it's an alpha three end. So you have to have more energy in the system to be able to get that third neutron out. And so often people will say, well, 28, if you just look at the astatine 211, you would say, why are you running at 28.8? .8? Because you have all of this extra cross section. But the answer is to avoid that astatine 210. So if you start, if you look at where the astatine 210 sets in, that sets the upper energy for where we use the, the alpha beam to make the astatine 211. If we went higher to try to capture this cross section, we would be in danger of making this, which no one wants to make, let's just say. Uh, a very reasonable response. Um, Yaven, what energy does University of Washington utilize? Um, we radiate at 29 MV. And we, uh, over the years, we use HPGE to monitor um, acetine 210 content. And uh, it has been very consistent that we don't produce that at a detectable level. So okay. thank you very that's much. That's just our experience. Okay. And Xiao Yu, uh, do you anticipate uh, uh, changing the, the energy at, uh, at the Ionetics Corporation's production facility, or are you going to stick with 27? 
So we will definitely optimize this production for energy and intensity as well. But this is a, you know, the work we are done just making sure we do the validation, be able to produce. We have the flexibility to changing the energy and also the intensity. We certainly intended to do that. Very good. Thank you. Uh, some of the answered questions. <clears throat> uh, the first one that came in was, I've got to go all the way back. Uh, so there's a question that came uh, from an anonymous attendee. Um, it was originally addressed to Professor Yanello, uh, but Professor Burns answered. And so the question was, uh, with a 34% plus or minus 22% radio labeling yield, um, at, is there room to improve or stabilize that? And uh, um, Professor Burns said, yes, the yield is low. Um, the reaction wasn't yet optimized. And I believe that they're looking at doing that at this point. Is that a fair statement, John? Yeah, that's definitely fair. I don't know if they're going to optimize that reaction necessarily. Um, there are some more relevant molecules that they're interested in that are proprietary. We can't really talk about at this point. Um, and my understanding is that the yields, the labeling yields are much better with those molecules because they've spent time optimizing those reactions. So, Great. Thank you. Uh, the next question, which I said we would address uh, in the open session, was uh, one that came from Mr. Richard Zimmerman. Uh, and his question was general questions regarding production capacity. What are the chances that the technology can be industrialized? What could the what could be the maximum production batch of daily capacity, either in militaries or doses of such a tool? Um, so I'm gonna let the panelists answer that, but I'm gonna give you a DOE perspective from the beginning which is that um, with the limited number of production facilities that are currently available, when we, when we began looking at the UIN, um, as time went on, we realized that uh, the only way to get a consistent flow of the radioisotope into the hands of the clinicians was going to be to um, both get the material into the hands of the researchers get those data published in publications and um, involve industry ultimately because industry was going to be the ones that were going to have to um, invest in new production facilities to really blanket the US. If you look at the, the five facilities that were available, you have a bi-coastal distribution and then a southerly distribution. Um, and that really leaves the, the the largest chunk of the Midwest, uh, anything west, or I'm sorry, anything east of the Rockies and uh, west of the Appalachians is really largely uncovered. So that's the DOE perspective. Uh, and, and that's how we're facing the, uh, uh, the, the issue through the world acetine community. Um, I will let the production facilities answer with respect to maximum potential capacities that that each of, of their sites think they can achieve. Nobody wants to volunteer. I mean, we, we, we have made 100 millicuries in, in a batch. We can probably go higher than that. Um, our machine is not dedicated to medical isotopes. Our machine is is a was built by the Atomic Energy Commission and does a lot of fundamental nuclear science and it does um, a radiation of chips going into electronics, uh, you know, electronics going into satellites. So um, it's it's a question of if the demand is there, then we will have to balance everything to see what we can do and we will attempt to um, meet the need as expressed through the DOE National the NIDC. Um, but I think it is really going to take a, a, a company like Ionetics that is a full-time commercial, this is what they do to, to actually serve the medical community once we get beyond the research stage. I think while we're in the research stage, we can be a significant contributor to making that happen and making it um, 
interesting enough for companies like Ionetics to get into the business and invest for the long haul. That's a great statement. Um, and I think we also heard from Professor Burns that there's a lot of research still to do. Um, Yavin, you looked like you wanted to say something, please. Yeah, I uh, also wanted to chime in. I agree 100% with what um, um, Sherry said. Um, I, um, you know, at UW, um, our cyclotron is in a similar situation. The primary application of the cyclotron is um, for fast neutron therapy. Um, and when it's available for acetine production, uh, we produce about uh, 26 millicuries after a, say, 45 or 50 minute irradiation. And, you know, if we, that's that's with our external target. And if you use an internal target, um, the production rate um, would be higher than that. And uh, um, I, th I think um, that like production maximum in terms of maximum production batch or daily uh, capacity that really depends um, like whether you have a dedicated cyclotron for acetine production and what your um, target setup is. So. Yeah, I would also why you um, say what amounts are produced for the clinical uh, productions. Yeah, uh, thank you, Brenda, for uh, asking that. Um, for the clinical trials, um, it, um, it's usually a uh, five-hour irradiation, and uh, um, at the end of EOB um, and, and of the bombardment, um, it's, um, I, I believe it's up to 100 uh, 20, 100, maybe up to 150 millicuries at some point. It just depends, yeah. So, so we're, we're cer certainly looking forward to scale up the production right now. So we are at a stage just to produce the first validation, making sure the cyclotron is working properly. The target is working properly. We are trying to optimize um, my, you know, beam pro, uh, beam energy intensity, beam spot onto the target, the target sickness. So we're in the process of doing the optimization. But once we scale, and this machine obviously eventually is going to be uh, dedicated for ISO for acetine two eleven production. So you know, several hungry millicuries a day uh, certainly is possible at the end of the EOB. So the processing. Uh, you know, that may, we're still in the process of establishing that as far as the uh, final product, uh, uh, can, as far as can, that concern. Somebody want to say anything about uh, reaching target saturation as being the limiting factor, especially with such a short-lived half-life? Uh, Ethan, I don't remember that number, but it's a very high, yeah, uh, we can do some calculations perhaps. Yeah, I, I don't know that that's an issue. I mean, we, we have already reached what was our um, our RAD license and had to get our, our license for Astatine 211 actually bumped up already once or twice, you know, so there's a license issue there. Um, but I think that's a it's a bigger issue. Very good. Okay, we've got other questions. Uh, question from my friend Koshin. Uh, this comes to us from uh, Fukushima Medical University. Uh, and Koshin says, great job, everyone. Current cyclotron facilities and efforts by companies like Dianetics are effective for patients in states surrounding Astatine uh, 211 production sites. How will DOE expand this effort across the whole US? Okay, so that's really a question for me. Um, I, Koshin, I think that the, uh, uh, the way that we're approaching this uh, is one of uh, involvement of industry. Um, you know, we've seen what we can do with respect to the sites that are currently funded. Um, we hope to continue to engage with those sites that aren't funded, uh, those university sites, um, 
but uh, uh, um, you know, I, I can't drag anyone to the table and and force them to uh, uh, to produce if if uh, if that's not something that they choose to do. So um, we are here. We are willing to have a conversation with uh, any of the remaining universities um, if that's something that they wish to engage in. If not, um, that's also fine. You know. Uh, the question comes down to how to expand this, and there are a few um, there are a few R and D efforts underway to look at alternative technologies that could be uh, brought to bear to expand the shipping distance. Uh, one of those being cryogenic um, uh, cryogenic shipping of uh, of a generator type device where you would cryo trap. Um, radon 211 and allow it to decay to the astatine 211. Um, that's something that's been brought up and is being being uh, uh, investigated. Other than that, it's like I said, it's largely uh, the industry, and um, uh, it's largely up to industry, and industry will dictate how they're going to pursue their own business case. Ethan, this is sort of more provocative question asking. Sure. You, but even, for example, at UW, even though we have access, we don't really have full access as the machine is multi use and probably could be used even more based on industry and other uses. Was the possibility of DOE supporting building or per, uh, funding for another cyclotron? Is that possible? I know it's huge amounts, but still, if you're able to produce large amounts, you can also think about shipping. That's true. I mean, in the land of public opinion, anything is always possible given the right budget. Um, that said, uh, I don't think it's anywhere within current DOE plans to look at investing in um, another production facility. Um, at this point, it could change in the future. Um, but you know, when you look at when you look at what is required to supply substantial quantities of astatine, um, that's it's a different type of machine than DOE typically invests in. When we look at investing in in infrastructure, most of the time it's to put something in place that uh, can't be can't be cobbled together with existing uh, machinery or uh, that no one else has. We, we're supposed to fill gaps and we're supposed to make investments in things that um, no one else has the ability to do. So what we're looking to do is to foster existing technology within the U.S. and help bring that to bear to cover this gap. Um, I, don't, I don't, in the immediate future, I don't see an investment to bring up a new facility. Uh, that might change. I might be told in the next couple of weeks that that's different. Uh, but currently, I don't I don't see that in the forecast. I would say not a new facility would be way more expensive than an additional machine that's dedicated to astatine because where you have all the expertise and and then it's so to me it's a different it's, it's a different question are different ask. I'm worried about these 30, 40 year old machines also that are yeah. we're relying on. So, yeah. My um, machine's over 50 years old, just- Are 50, <laughs> yeah. How old is ours, John? Uh, so the UW machine was installed in 83. Was it 83? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's 40. Yeah, right at. So. Uh, and then, uh, show you how old was the CS30 that, that your company refurbished? That's probably 40 years old. Yeah, but so, okay, but the guts are new at this point, so it's a big... right, right, exactly. So, the cycle from the cyclotron point of view, the key part, uh, you know, the magnet will never fail, it doesn't, it's a piece of steel with some coppers and run current. So, magnetic field is a very stable. The key is the RF systems. And you will have the RF breaking down, the parts of, uh, will decay. And that's what we do is uh, we're going to have this new RF systems built, ground up new parts, uh, new design, and that will 
uh, allow us to run the system much more reliable, have more access time, and uh, produce more isotope. That's what uh, the direction we want to go. And uh, also, we're going to be updating the iron source, uh, and the target is, is new. So that machine, in principle, the outside is still old, but the inside is a, is a new machine. Very good. So what are you doing with the RF? Or maybe this is not a conversation for here. Right. So there's a there's a lot of a parts uh, absolute uh, abs obsolete. We can't find a manufacturer making these parts anymore. There's a these are tube based uh, amplifier. So we're designing new uh, structure to support to uh, to to more reliable. There's a lot of these uh, copper connectors which we have to build a new one. So. We're, we're, uh, this one, we made it work, it's working properly, but eventually if something goes wrong, shutting down, especially maintain this uh, high demand for production, we wanna making sure uh, we have a system as a backup. And eventually we may produce more of these kind of machines. This new system, we can actually hook on with the new machine and uh, uh, for the new machine as well. So that's uh, for the long-term consideration. So you're going to a different tube design? Is that what I'm hearing? Or it's still the same tube, but uh, whatever the 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 system put it into the cabinet, the, the location, the insulating, and we're changing a lot of a design based on thirty, you know, forty years uh, technology. We have a new ways to handling these high voltage platform now, which we use at the MSU and other places. So that's the direction we'll go. It's a brand new, uh, well, okay. So still based on a lot of our principles using some of the old design, but uh, updated, let me put it this way. Thank you. So I would be remiss not to uh, uh, echo that uh, um, the director of the isotope program has confirmed uh, uh, my, my original assumption. We have no plans to uh, invest in a production facility as industry is capable of producing the uh, the isotope uh, acetine 211, and uh, we don't wish to compete. So what we would rather do is promote regional production at universities and our national labs and industry through uh, the world acetine community. So oh, you can you tell me which industry is producing it so you that just we can heard, get it from? So you've just heard. Uh, uh, right, but it's not available. So Right. So, you know, we're, we're, we are looking at methods and um, uh, modes of interaction to facilitate industrial relations. So you'll hear more about those uh, in, well, in during this fiscal year. Uh, that's one of the, uh, the large assignments on my plate is to, to work with my counterparts in the world acetine community and um, uh, solidify the uh, um, sort of the inner workings of the community. Well, I can tell, yeah, I would urge you of some urgency because we do these clinical trials and, you know, we've treated, I don't know, close to 60 patients and, but people say, well, so what if you can only do it in Seattle and that will become the attitude. Right. And so yeah, right now we're getting grant funding, but it will, if you can't show the ability and that's the biggest question we get, how can we get this out to other places? And it doesn't have to be to every place, but if you, it's an unusual, like with CAR T, you know, the immunotherapy started at small centers of excellence, but you had to have more than just one place. So I will point out that, uh, um, as you mentioned, uh, Acetine 211 is available through University of Washington. Uh, shortly will become available through University or through Texas A&M University. And neither of those sites are at capacity yet. So if you're if you're within shipping distance of those sites, you can get the material. Um, it would be you know it would be, there would be some decay in transit, obviously. Yeah, not adequate though for clinical trials. Very true, very true. Uh, Alexander Rusikov asks, "What is the one most burning unanswered questions?" Uh, a question about acetine chemistry now. So anybody want to take a stab at that? John should, but I think it's oxidation states. 
Yeah, I think that uh, I would I would say two. Um, what the oxidation state is and what the bond strength of the particular oxidation state you have is. I mean, it, we, we, we know we're learning that the, for instance, the carbon bond formation is much weaker than the iodine carbon bond formation. And so it's a challenge for labeling compounds that we want to uh, administer because the, the, the decoupling of the acetine is a real concern. And so I think those two things, what is the redox state and how does that affect the bond um, are really important. Yeah, Ben? Yeah, uh, uh, thanks, Jonathan, for your uh, comment. And uh, I agree with you, what you said. I would like to add uh, one thing I care a lot about, uh, which is the in vivo stability of acetine labeled compound. I think that is really the most burning uh, an answer question to me and to our group. Um, our group uses a, a right now for uh, labeling of antibodies. Our group uses a um, boron cage labeling molecule. And we have uh, shown in uh, many, many uh, preclinical and uh, uh, now even in uh, clinical studies in collaboration with um, the Fred Hutch investigators um, that this uh, boron uh, reagent is um, providing um, a adequate stability, uh, we say, for um, intact antibodies. However, you know, for um, acetine labeled small molecules and peptides, and you know, some other um, applications, and depending on what disease types, you know, when those smaller molecules are required there is really still a very big need for the development of um, better and more stable labeling methods. And so that's my uh, comment. Thank you. Thank you, Yevhen. That's a, it's a point well taken. Uh, I'm sure most folks are aware of previous clinical trials. Um, and if you're not, then you should go back and take a look at the literature. There's a lot of really interesting previous uh, inhuman studies that have been done uh, uh, both in Sweden as well as in the U.S. Um, in different forms of malignancies. Uh, let's see. Someone wants to know if DOE anticipates making further investments in target handling. Um, so the answer to that question is one should take a look at... Um, um, either targeted R&D solicitations that uh, the DOE isotope program puts out every two years. It's called our biennial R&D solicitation. Or you can also take a look at what we refer to as the annual open solicitation, the open call. Um, there's a very, very long name. I think it's a um, annual r and or annual financial assistance uh, uh, solicitation from the Office of Science, something of that nature. Um, it's generally the first solicitation that's published uh, each fiscal year. Um, and I would encourage everyone to take a look at the various uh, subject areas under the isotope program. The short answer, that's the long answer to your question. The short answer to your question is, it's certainly a subject area that we are interested in. Minimizing dose to the worker um, and having effective translation from the uh, site of irradiation to the target processing laboratory is always something that is intriguing, compelling, and um, uh, could, could be considered uh, fundable. Okay, I don't see any further open questions. We have a minute, maybe a little bit less, a minute, four seconds by my last count left in the session. Um, if there are no further questions, I want to thank this panel for a very, very productive afternoon. Um, I know I learned a lot. 
I hope everyone who attended also did. And if you have questions for the panelists, um, you can please funnel those through the NIDC. They uh, they can they can supply me with a list of questions and I can get them to the right panelists to, to have those answered for you. Uh, otherwise, thank you all. And I will give you back 30 seconds of your afternoon. Take care, everybody. Have a good day.